Hi, I'm Jeanette Roche. This is Bridge City News. Here are some of the top stories we've been following. Prime Minister promises over $1.2 billion to address homelessness in Canada. Plus, the town of Coaldale, Alberta, no longer the only place in Canada to pay 100% for its RCMP. And following a lag in new developments, a landlord's market is being predicted for Lethbridge's industrial sector. Your nation. Your province your Southern Alberta. From the heart of Lethbridge, it's Bridge City News with Jeanette Roche. Thanks so much for joining us. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau has unveiled a 28-page housing strategy that includes new tax incentives. The pre-budget announcement also promises $1.25 billion to address homelessness and a Canada-wide effort to build more housing on public land. The Liberals are trying to win back significant ground lost to the Conservatives over cost-living issues. It builds on the sizable investments we've made over the years and it goes a lot further. It's a plan to build housing, including for renters, on a scale not seen in generations. We're talking about almost 3.9 million homes by 2031. The construction industry will need reinforcements to get all this work done. So as part of our plan, we're going to be increasing support for workers in the skilled trades creating apprenticeship opportunities for the next generation of workers, creating opportunities for young people, and investments to cut red tape for those with foreign credentials. Alberta Premier Danielle Smith says her policy of ensuring Ottawa works through her province to deliver housing money will apply no matter who is in the Prime Minister's chair. Earlier this week, Smith's government tabled a bill that seeks to block Alberta cities from negotiating deals with the federal government on the grounds the feds aren't respecting provincial jurisdiction. And just the other day, we introduced the Provincial Priorities Act, which will ensure that cities and other provincially funded and regulated entities must have provincial government approval to receive federal funding. Because for years, Liberal governments in Ottawa, with almost no representation in Alberta, have been imposing their destructive agenda on Alberta taxpayers through direct funding agreements with cities and provincially regulated and funded organizations. We believe Albertans are t entitled to their fair share of tax dollars and to have those dollars spent on Albertans' priorities. And we will ensure that happens. Uh, Alberta is not alone in this. Quebec has had similar legislation for years. And in November, premiers across the country were united in demanding that the federal government work with and through the provinces when making arrangements with municipalities. Alberta's advanced education minister is rejecting concerns her government's proposed Ottawa gatekeeping bill would jeopardize half a million dollars in federal funding for academic research in post-secondary schools. Advanced education minister Rajan Sani says the goal is to keep the money flowing but ensure projects funded by the federal government match provincial priorities. Our financial statements indicate that $500 million are received by Alberta post-secondary institutions sent by the federal government every year. And I believe that Albertans have a right to know what these grants are, what they're funding, and Bill 18 will enable us to collect that information. But I do want to assure our post-secondary partners that they will be at the table as we conduct our engagement to make sure that the approvals process aligns with their priorities as well. The town of Coaldale, Alberta will soon no longer be the only place in all of Canada to pay 100% for its RCMP. The Alberta government announced today an annual funding for Coaldale to cover local policing costs that they say the federal government is refusing to pay. BCN's Naveen Day has the details. Since signing a policing agreement with the federal government in 2016, Coaldale has been the only municipality to cover 100% of its contract with the federally run RCMP. Minister of Public Safety and Emergency Services Mike Ellis announced Friday morning that the province will be stepping in to provide an annual provincial grant to ease some financial burden from Coaldale ratepayers. Ellis calls the refusal from the federal government to foot the bill, quote, unacceptable and completely unfair. Albertans deserve to feel safe and protected in their communities and deserve equal treatment when it comes to uh, police service funding. With no indication that Public Safety Canada is interested in resolving this unfair uh, singling out of small town Alberta, we are taking action today. Alberta's government is stepping up 
to provide Coaldale with $550,000 in funding to cover local policing costs that the federal government is refusing to pay. The funding will provide Coaldale ratepayers with the same 30% subsidy that the federal government extends to similarly sized towns across the country that are policed by the RCMP under municipal contracts. Coaldale Mayor Jack Van Ryan said the money is much needed for the town and it should have never been excluded from federal funding to begin with. Town of Coldale is no different than any other municipality with the rising inflation costs and all the expenses that a municipality finds that, that comes to it uh, to our community. This funding will go a long way in um, getting us past the finish line when it comes to our budget deliberations. In fact, when uh, our council set the budget for this year, we based it on receiving this uh, grant. And with, without receiving that money, we would have had to come back to the council table to deliberate how we were going to either cut or raise ta taxes for our residents. Tabor Warner MLA Grant Hunter is pleased with Friday's announcement, something he says was an issue that was needing to be worked on for many years. It's been a long haul. We've gone through a few ministers. And it's interesting because when we went up and sat down with uh, with Minister Ellis, uh, I know that the team had prepared, they had worked hard, they had figured out how they can present and had gone through his, you know, left no stone unturned. And Minister Ellis adds calls were sent out to the feds on the issue, calls that he says fell on deaf ears. It's not without lack of trying on uh, both the provincial government side, the town of Coldale side, and in fact, even the uh, the R RCMP in Alberta themselves, again, tried to essentially lobby the federal government and Public Safety Canada to have them with fair and equitable treatment like every other police, uh, police uh, or every other town that has contract policing in Canada. And in all cases, including from the RCMP's side, from the provincial government side, from the town of Coldale side, has been nothing but deaf ears. For Bridge City News, I'm Naveen Day. The trial for three men accused of orchestrating the Coots border blockade continued this week. On Thursday, the defense was suggesting his client was nothing more than a messenger in relation to the COVID era blockade. Marco Van Hugenboss is one of three defendants on trial for their roles in the protest that tied up cross border traffic between Alberta and Montana for two weeks in early 2022. His lawyer has told the court in Lethbridge that Van Hugenboss was only relaying decisions from those in charge. RCMP Sergeant Greg Tulock says although Van Hugenboss didn't orchestrate the protest, he seemed to grow into a leadership role. The trial runs until April 19th with closing arguments scheduled for next week. And speaking of Marco Van Hugenboss, the defendant recently resigned from his seat as a Fort McLeod town councillor when he was facing charges related to the Coots border blockade. During one of his last town council sessions in February, Van Hugenboss made the announcement that he was leaving due to facing legal and personal challenges that may indirectly cast the town in a negative light. Meanwhile, the town of Fort McLeod has announced they're now preparing for a by-election to fill Van Hugenboss's seat. Nomination day was this past Monday, and election day is slated for Monday, May the 6th from 10 a.m. till 8 p.m. The four candidates vying for the councillor vacancy are Werner Dressler, Bill Hall, Jamit Patel, and Sidney Tobler. The Supreme Court has ruled that an Alberta First Nation ended up with less land than it should have received under a treaty signed over a century ago. The court says the Blood Tribe near Lethbridge was entitled to more than 162 square miles of additional territory in 1877. It says the Crown quote, dishonorably breached the treaty provisions. The First Nation has long argued that Canada did not fulfill a promise to set aside a reserve with an area of one square mile for each family of five people. Lethbridge police are seeking video evidence from the public to assist with an ongoing investigation. Last night at approximately 7.24 p.m., police responded to multiple calls of a man with a weapon walking in and out of traffic along Mayor McGrath Drive and striking at vehicles. Police located and arrest arrested Scott Anthony Angel Varhog. 
34 of Lethbridge, who is charged with two counts of assault with a weapon, possession of a dangerous weapon, causing a disturbance, mischief under $5,000, and failure to comply with a probation order. Anyone who may have a cell phone or dash cam footage of the incident around the area of Mayor McGrath Drive and 23rd Street North and 9th Avenue South between 6.55 p.m. and 7.35 p.m. to come forward or call that number on your screen. We have an update to a heartwarming story brought, uh, we brought to you earlier this month. Alan, a 61-year-old man and his dog visited Tabor Police Service to let them know they're doing well. The large Akita dog, aptly named Hero, became an actual hero before Tabor Police responded to a complaint on March 28th about a man who was bitten by a dog near the Tabor Sugar Factory property. When officers located the dog, they found his owner nearby who got stuck in a muddy ditch two days prior. The man's dog stayed by his side to keep him warm and even fended off coyotes. Allen expressed his gratitude to the police and the community who helped him and his dogs who received treatment for their injuries. In a social media post, Tabor Police said, quote, it was great to see them, especially considering last time was under less than ideal circumstances, I would say so. Well, Lethbridge and District Exhibition presented its first monthly report to Lethbridge City Council on Thursday. Acting CEO Kim Gallucci said the November to February deficit of $341,194 is better than expected, adding this includes the major revenue generator of Ag Expo and that they look forward to the summer's uh, farmers markets and whoop up days this year. The district and exhibition's initial budget projected a $6.5 million shortfall in 2024, prompting both the signing of a memorandum of understanding between them and the city and city council requesting monthly financial updates on the operations. Changes in climate and weather in southern Alberta are causing the city of Lethbridge to worry about water scarcity and ongoing drought conditions. So they're addressing those concerns with the development of a water conservation plan and strategy. The strategy aims to reduce water use in the city by 20% by the year 2030. This would address long-term changes in water usage behavior. Officials say updates to the Water Rationing Action Plan are also being considered, which they say would address an immediate crisis. So water conservation is really looking to change the long-term behavior of, of individuals in order, in looking at how they use water and where they can conserve water and uh, not waste water is essentially what water conservation is looking at. Whereas the water rationing are really come into regulatory measures that can be put in place in order to uh, either limit the amount or the timing of water being, being utilized. The plan outlines incentives and rebates for items like rain barrels, water efficient toilets, and any suggested changes to the water bylaw from the updated water rationing action plan will go to city council in the coming months. After last year saw a lag in new developments in Lethbridge due to conservative market sentiment, a landlord's market is being forecasted for Lethbridge's industrial sector. To discuss this in more detail, I'm bringing in Doug Maresca, managing broker at Evison Young Lethbridge. Doug, the market report says it's anticipating the Lethbridge commercial real estate sector will see a landlord's market by the end of 2024. So can you maybe expand on that a little and explain why this would be the case? So the reason we say that it's a landlord's market right now is there hasn't been any new construction, uh, significant new construction built for tenants in the last couple of years, basically since 2020. And that was driven mainly because construction costs have really gone up significantly. So the investor slash landlord can't, couldn't justify building a building for the market rents that we were getting. Um, so right now what we're seeing is the rents are starting to go up. Uh, tenants are doing well in our community and they can afford to pay the higher rents. So the rents are going up slowly. Uh, there's always a bit of a lag because generally tenants have leases that are signed for you know, five to 10 years. So until those leases come up for renewal, there's a, there's a lag and there's no opportunity to renegotiate and redo your lease rate. So we're starting to see that increase happen now. 
And we anticipate by maybe this time next year or even later in 2025 that the lease rates are going to match the construction costs. Okay, so you're saying tenants are able to pay higher rents. Now, that's surprising being that we just came out of a pandemic and saw a lot of people lose their businesses and not be able to afford their rental spaces. I'm very positive. I get to speak for our for our area and our clients and everything is like our clients are expanding. Um, we're just working right now on a, a new industrial park on the uh, east side of 43rd Street. Yeah, it's a 60 acre site and we have uh, be four people starting construction here in the next 30 days. On the guests from the ground, we're seeing very positive, positive stories. Okay, so commercial rents are going up and we can anticipate seeing more construction on commercial real estate. So Doug, we talked about landlords, but what does this mean for tenants going forward since this will be a landlord's market? That's a good point. So if I, my the advice I would give a tenant is if you do have a lease coming up in the next 12 months, the ways that, ways that you can maybe uh, mitigate the increases is to offer something back to your landlord. For another, in other words, maybe offer to sign a long-term lease, sign for 10 years, um, because the because that gives you gives you a bit of an advantage. Is for one, it solidifies your lease rate for the next 10 years, but it also allows the landlord to get better financing terms of his bank. So if they're borrowing money to finance other projects, if if there's a long-term lease in place, the banks will usually offer better terms. So that's what I would do if I was a tenant. Some good advice there. Thank you, Doug. That was great. I really appreciate you taking the time. Doug Maresca is the managing broker at Avison Young Lethbridge. Well, it's going to be a beautiful weekend weather-wise in the Lethbridge region. We're seeing highs of 20 and 22 just ahead of more snow next week. That's right. I said it, that dreaded S word. I'll be back after the break with a full look at weather. Welcome back. Increasing cloudiness is expected this evening in Lethbridge. Uh, we could also see winds from the west at 40, gusting to 60 kilometers per hour. But then those winds are going to die down and the clouds are going to clear because we are going to see some clear skies uh, tomorrow on Saturday. Beautiful weekend ahead of us. Look at that. High of 22 Saturday, 19 for a high on Sunday, back up to 22 on Monday with clear skies. And that's just before we're going to have this drastic drop in temperature. So here's what's going to happen Monday. We've got a system moving through. It's going to bring 60% chance of uh, showers on Monday evening. Those showers could turn to flurries for the rest of the week there. So Tuesday, we are seeing a 60% chance of showers or flurries. High of four degrees, high of two only on Wednesday with a 60% chance of showers or flurries. And then same thing for Wednesday with a high of five. So let's hope that it just stays showers uh, because we do need the moisture, just not the snow, right? We don't want the snow, but we need the moisture. So the average high for this time of year, 12 degrees average low, minus two, 24. That was our high temperature on this day. That was the record that happened back in 2004. And the cold record on this day happened in 1968. It was a chilly minus 14. Sun rose this morning at 643 right there and sunset tonight at 821 p.m. That looks like 13 hours and 38 minutes of daylight to me. Okay, on the West Coast tomorrow, a little bit of a clear one. Gonna be lovely, 16 for high in Victoria, high of 14 in Vancouver. As we look to Edmonton, also 14 degrees and a beautiful 17 degrees expected tomorrow in Calgary with mainly sunny skies. As we look to the rest of the prairies, Saskatoon, high of 18 degrees, clear skies there, Regina, high of 20, beautiful sun, sunny skies as well. Could see a 30% chance of showers in Winnipeg, 18 for a high. As we look to central Canada, also seeing more precipitation. Actually, as we get further east, we're just seeing tons of moisture. Looking at 40% chance of showers in Toronto, high of 10 degrees. Rain expected tomorrow in Ottawa, seven for a high. And Montreal also seeing rain with a high of nine degrees. There is a rainfall warning in effect this evening in Halifax. I could see up to 30 millimeters of rain this evening and a risk of a thunderstorm. And then tomorrow, another five millimeters of rain, high of 14 degrees. So uh, we're looking at a high of 12 in Halifax. Tomorrow could also see some showers. Rain expected tomorrow as well in Charlottetown, high of 16. And rain as well in St. John's tomorrow with a high of 13. So there you have it. That is your forecast. 
Home sales in Canada rose 1.7% last month compared with a year ago. The Canadian Real Estate Association says it now expects more than 492,000 homes to trade hands this year, a 10.5% increase from last year. CREA says the average price of a home sold last month amounted to $698,530, up 2% from March of 2023. The national average home price is also forecast to climb 4.9% on an annual basis, up to $710,468 this year. On a month-over-month -month basis, home sales in March were up a half a percent. Thousands of Ford SUVs have been recalled in Canada and the U.S. because of a gas leak that could cause a fire. The recall covers a certain Bronco Sport SUVs from the 2022 and 23 model years, as well as escapes from 2022. Instead of repairing leaky fuel injectors, dealers will install a tube to let gasoline flow away from hot surfaces to the ground below the vehicle. The nonprofit Center for Auto Safety called Ford's remedy for the fuel leak as a quote, band-aid type recall to avoid the cost of repairing the fuel injectors. Now here's a look at today's market. Stock prices took a significant hit today. The TSX was down 210 points today to finish at 21,899. The Dow was down 475 points to 37,983. The S&P 500 was down 75 on the day to 51.23. And the Nasdaq was down 267 points to finish at 16,175. West Texas Intermediate Oil was up 64 cents to 85.66 US per barrel. Natural gas was up a cent to $1.77 US. Gold was down 28 to 14 to 2,344 and 37 cents US an ounce. And silver was down 57 points to 2788 US an ounce. Feed wheat is at $8.63 per bushel, barley is at $6.49, canola is at $14.30, and corn is at $7.87 per bushel. Live cattle were down $1.35 to $1.78.90. Feeder cattle were down $1.58 to $2.37.60. Lean hogs were down $0.58 cents to $90.88, and the Canadian dollar was down over the past 24 hours to $72.60 U.S. Recapping one of our top stories, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau has unveiled a 28-page housing strategy that includes new tax incentives. The pre-budget announcement also promises $1.25 billion to address homelessness and a Canada-wide effort to build more housing on public land. The Liberals are trying to win back significant ground lost to the Conservatives over cost of living issues. Coming up, I speak with Lorian Johansson, Vice President of the Lethbridge Historical Society, who shares insights on the development of our city and southern Alberta. Also, when you see news happening in your community, be sure and send us an email at info at bridgecitynews.ca. And be sure to visit our website anytime to check out a number of stories and interviews. Well, Lethbridge and Southern Alberta have a fascinating, rich history to look back upon, and we perhaps don't take enough time to reflect upon it, but today's guest is going to help us do just that. Lorian Johansson is the Vice President of the Lethbridge Historical Society. Welcome to Bridge City News, Lorian. Great to have you on today. Thank you so much for the invitation. I always love to talk about Lethbridge's history. Awesome. Okay, well, with that said, maybe uh, give our viewers a brief snapshot of what your organization is all about. It's not just Lethbridge history, right, but Southern Alberta, all of Southern Alberta? That's correct. Okay. So the Lethbridge Historical Society is a chapter of the Historical Society of Alberta. Uh, our chapter covers the Southern Alberta region, sort of from just south of Calgary down to the border. Uh, so it does encompass quite a lot of Southern Alberta, including all of the small towns. Uh, they are free to access our resources and we do a lot of work with them as well. We do tend to focus on Lethbridge uh, because that's where we're based, but we do also cover a lot of other things in, in the region. 
Okay, great. Well, uh, maybe give us an idea of what takes place as a, at, a, at a typical meeting or gathering of the Lethbridge Historical Society. Well, we have uh, several different options as far as gatherings. On the fourth Tuesday of every month uh, during September through April, we host uh, a general meeting for our membership uh, where we conduct a little bit of business uh, and then we move into a presentation format. We invite guest speakers from all different walks of life to come and speak to our members and guests about things that are relevant or interesting. We've had horticulture and we've had uh, how to plant a victory garden uh, in your front yard or backyard. Oh, we've okay. had it, it was fascinating as yes, what kind of vegetables you can grow in southern Alberta that you can then turn around and eat uh, to be a little bit more self-sustaining and environmentally conscious. That was a really great one. Uh, we've uh, talked about our plaques and monuments pro project. We Anything that really would be fascinating or interesting to uh, our membership and to the general public. So that's one of the ways. We do also conduct uh, tours, walking tours of the city and local area. Uh, some of them are the Downtown History and Beer Tour, which most people are familiar with. That was uh, initiated by the LHS here. And we do some for general public. We do some for the membership. So we have a lot of tours that take place throughout the year. We have several coming up actually uh, over the next few months. And then the other thing is to join the executive council and sit on the board with the rest of the team so that happens uh, on Monday. So there's several different ways to get involved. It sounds like it. So obviously this is this is something people can join in. How can people maybe join up for your group? Uh, the easiest way is to attend one of the general meetings and sign up for your membership with one of the executive that's there. We do also have a website, lethbridgehistory.org, and memberships are available through there, as well as a contact us form. So if you have questions, you can certainly submit an email request uh, and somebody will be able to guide you through becoming a member. Okay, so why don't we begin with the name of the city? So I think a lot of people assume uh, the name Lethbridge stems from the famous bridge that spans the coolies, but that isn't necessarily the case now, is it? It's not at all the case, actually. Okay. Uh, Lethbridge was named after William Lethbridge. He was the president and largest shareholder of the Northwestern Coal and Navigation Company. Uh, you know how the NMAX Center is named after the sponsor NMAX? Lethbridge is something similar to that. He got the city named after him because of his money that he invested into the company. He never actually visited Lethbridge at all, not even once. Oh, wow. Well, that's disappointing. Yeah. <laughs> so it all it comes down little. to money, right? And unfortunately, that's the case. Yeah. It has been for a long time. It's a little bit more of a romantic notion to think it's about the bridge, really. Sure. I can see where yeah. the rumor got started. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It makes sense. But it's completely a coincidence that it's left bridge and right. we have a bridge. And then we, we become Bridge City. Yes, I know. Yeah. That's so interesting. So, I mean, speaking of the bridge, that iconic high-level bridge is often referred to as the longest in the world. And there are, of course, longer bridges elsewhere, but I believe it's there still are. the longest of its specific type in the world. Can you maybe share a little bit about the history of that bridge? Of course, the, the bridge is in fact the longest for its height and style uh, in the world. Nobody has built anything that's longer and higher of the same style trestle bridge. And that bridge. would be like a trestle uh, bridge, yeah. That's right. Yeah. Okay. It was announced in 1906 and completed three years later. It is still the largest single railway structure in Canada. Uh, it was put into place to shorten the trip to Fort McLeod. Instead of having to go down and around the river valley, the bridge was put in place so that they could just skip over the top and shave off several hours at least of their train journey. Uh, the walls on the side of the bridge, you've seen them there, uh, they're to make sure that the trains don't get pushed off by our wind, our beautiful wind in southern Alberta. Oh my gosh, that's it, scary. It's a safety, I didn't even think safety. that's a possibility, but <laughs> now that you said it, yeah. Well, you know, the wind can get pretty powerful down here in southern Alberta, so they put those measures in place. Uh, the construction of the bridge is actually considered a national historic event. Uh, over 100 men worked on the construction of the bridge. Uh, there were a few deaths 
during the construction, safety measures for workers were not what they are now. Uh, there is a very famous photograph of two men leaping off the last structure to be lowered into place. Uh, they were promptly fired after that. They did not die, but they were fired for their shenanigans. Oh my gosh. I think I have seen that picture and they're jumping basically Most into people the river, have, yeah. right? But they're jumping from the piece of steel uh, off to the side uh, of the yes, bay. where the yeah. land is. Okay. Yeah. Yes. It's, so it's not as high as we think at that point. But no, still. no. <laughs> still. Uh, safety first, gentlemen. Come on, let's not yeah. give other people ideas, right? You know, in the early 1900s, they didn't have uh, fall safe harnesses. They didn't have there any of no those things. There was no such thing as safety back then. <laughs> Basically. That's right. I Which may it. be one of the reasons why safety harnesses and whatnot were put into place yeah. as we moved through the 19th and 20th centuries, uh, because people did things like that. I don't know. That's just my speculation, <laughs> but it makes sense. It's a yeah. There you go. Okay, so moving on from the bridge, we have a school named after. Uh, so we've got some other famous names here in town. So we have a school named after Nicholas Sharon, and a hospital named after Sir Alexander Galt, and both were businessmen who started coal mines here. So to what degree did coal mining impact Lethbridge in the early years? There, there were over a hundred mines in the Lethbridge coal fields, somewhere between Picture Brute, Ute, and McGrath. Uh, in 1919, we were the highest producing coal field in Canada, uh, and it helped to determine where Lethbridge was built. It brought in industries such as Lethbridge Iron Works. Uh, it was a major employer, brought a lot of families to the area, and started other communities like Coalhurst and Diamond City. Uh, it's it's almost impossible to quantify the importance of coal mining to our development. Uh, it it was the founding reason for for Lethbridge's construction here, uh, and then as we moved out of coal mining, that's when we moved into more of an agricultural uh, community. But we definitely started as that industrial coal mining uh, location. That's why the city sprang up where it did. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And then, of course, uh, in addition to that, Southern Alberta has a rich Indigenous history. So the River Valley has a, a park named Indian Battle Park, where Fort Whoop Up mm -hmm. is located. So maybe share a brief history about that. The Indian Battle Park is the name that was chosen by City Council in the 1960s. Uh, and it specifically refers to a battle in the fall of 1870, between the Blackfoot Nations and the Cree Nations. It was a winter camping area protected from the weather and that. <clears throat> and where the high level bridge is now was a very natural crossing point in the river. Um, we do have a book about the Indian battle that went on there, several different editions. Uh, but the, the story of how these two nations fought over rights to the land and the, the ability to camp there. It's much more than I could cover in such a short time, but that's why it's named that because our Indigenous peoples camped there and wintered there to stay safe from the elements. Yeah, and then of course, speaking of Indigenous uh, people, uh, people from around the world travel to Alberta specifically to visit Head Smashed in Buffalo Jump. So for any viewers who have never heard about this or have ever been there, what is that all about? Uh, Head Smashed in Buffalo Jump is, it's a national historic site. It's a provincial heritage site and a world heritage site, all of which were designated through the 60s, late 60s into the early 80s. It's a place where the, the indigenous peoples would drive the buffalo off the cliff in order to harvest them. It, it is definitely a fascinating uh, interpretive center there. If you haven't been, I definitely recommend it. It's a, a very eye-opening look into how Indigenous people manage to hunt in such large capacities. And there are guides and books uh, available online that give you a lot of the details of the history of, of the location, but where it's one of, our, one of our national heritage sites that we're very proud to be quite close to Lethbridge. Yeah, I believe it's a, a UNESCO heritage site, isn't it? 
Yeah, yes. That's amazing. Okay, now, uh, Laurie, and you mentioned agriculture earlier, uh, and of course that is a big part of Southern Alberta, especially the sugar beet industry. So I believe that, uh, that that also brought quite a few Japanese immigrants to our area. So maybe can you tell us a bit about that? Hey, the sugar beet industry has been operating in Lethbridge to this day since the early 1900s. Uh, you are correct. Some Japanese immigrants moved here. They were recruited to work in the first factory in Raymond uh, and in the beet fields. Uh, some of these families still, their descendants are still in and around Lethbridge. Um, during the Second World War, 2,500 of these Japanese Canadians were relocated here by the government to work in the beet fields. Uh, it was considered later in life it was considered uh, a human rights violation to uproot these families uh, and move them here with no, no choice in the matter. The, the Canadian government did issue an official apology to the families in 1988, but those families did settle here and some of them remain here to this day, at least parts of them. So the sugar beet industry has always been important to Lethbridge uh, and agriculture. Some for good reason, some for bad, obviously. I mean, history, history. we like to think of history as this, this happy, nostalgic style thing. But some of Canadian history is not pleasant and it's not yeah. nice. And we have to, we have to acknowledge that uh, before we can move out of that cycle. They say history, uh, those who don't study history are doomed to repeat it. So by, by studying history and the real honest nitty gritty facts about it perhaps we can avoid those sorts of things as we grow and develop exactly. as a society yeah the more you learn about it the more you can uh, avoid it and yeah exactly it's fascinating though Lorian. and uh moving on from there lethbridge and area are also known for its history of irrigation canals, much of that was put in place by our Mormon community. So that, that of course, has really influenced the culture of Southern Alberta, hasn't it? It, it has. Um, Lethbridge and Southern Alberta, heavily Mormon. Uh, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. They've, they've brought a lot and contributed a lot. Uh, the agreement was made by Alexander Galt with the LDS Church so that their, their settlers would build canals and then they received land and money as payment for their work. Uh, they were brought in because they came from Utah originally, where they were experts in dry land farming and the different skills required. Uh, and it was able to transform the area uh, around Lethbridge to make more crops possible because we needed high dollar value crops to be able to be grown here. So that it was sort of a, they got to move to somewhere new and get land and money for it. Uh, we got the benefit of their dry land farming knowledge and irrigation. I am learning so much here. It's fascinating. It, Lethbridge is so rich in, in history and how all of these things that we, we see now still, we drive over irrigation canals and we see, uh, the sugar beet factories and we we go down to the park and we see the mine sites of six and eight galt mine six and eight that are still the ruins are still there uh and lethbridge exists because these things were brought in and, and this area of the the world was made hospitable yeah it's amazing it's awesome thanks so much uh, again for for being with us today it looks like we're out of time but we really appreciate having you on here lorian well, thank you so much. Uh, I would just like to mention that we do have several members only tours coming up in April, June and October. So if you'd like to get involved with the bars and taverns or the murder mysteries of Lethbridge's past, uh, please go on our website, get a membership, and then those tours will be open for our members. And we welcome members of the public to our general meetings, again, the fourth Tuesday of every month, usually at the community room in the public library. Awesome. Thank you so much for that, Lorian. Uh, very, very interesting. Great to have you on today. Thank you again for the invitation. Absolutely. Lorian Johansson is the Vice President of the Lethbridge Historical Society.
We all know that people have different personalities, but do we know to what extent this can impact marital relationships? And perhaps more controversially, there are gender differences which can also impact marriage. Joining us to discuss this is Brent Taylor. He is a Lethbridge marriage coach and the author of His and Hers Greatest Need. Brent, welcome to BCN. So great to have you back. Thanks, Naveen. It's uh, great to be here and great to meet you. Thank you for having me. Now, Brent, first of all, can you briefly share a bit about what you do to help couples improve their relationships? Well, I would say there's a few different things, but one of them is to truly understand each other as best as they can, to give them that insight. You, you truly understand someone when they understand that you understand them. And so I share with them the insight in a very broad and deep level, probably more than most. There's a lot of different uh, tools and insights and, and things that I use to help them understand each other. And then I help to inspire them. Um, I coached hockey for 13 years and I realized inspiration precedes perspiration. Hmm. So uh, I help to inspire them and help them to really understand the motive is the key to everything. I had a large manufacturing company and people knew what to do and how to do it. That's very important. And most men are about how to do something. But there's no motive behind the how. There's no passion behind the how. It's process-based. And men tend to be more that way. But the key is getting to the heart. So when we, when we have inspiration at the heart level, then that fuels the, the power that's needed to really work on the hows and the whats. So I help people say, what do you do? I help get to their heart. I help get to their want button. I help them want to love one another. It's interesting what you said about how men are very um, process oriented because it seems like a lot of us guys, when we see a problem, we approach it like a problem with our car. Like when your car is broken, find the problem, order the part, install the car part, car fix. And you can't really do that with your, with your spouse. Like, oh, wife broken, discover problem, order part, order flowers, wife fixed. You can't really do that, can you? N not like that. Yes, we can, um, because what we give is what she receives. And she was designed to receive uh, a certain character, a certain trait, a certain um, love, if you will. And that's why there's 14 elements in the definition of love, which is a wedding vow. There's 14. So I encourage men to learn each one of those 14. Um, when you realize it's actually who you were designed to be, it's your nature to be that way. Uh, and you realize the gift that you're going to get, not because you want to get anything from your wife, but the joy you're going to have inside by seeing your wife shine is going to be worth it. And so, you know, love is patient, love is kind, it's content, it's not boastful, it's forgiving, it's honest, there's a whole variety of things. So when men realize this is what their wife is looking for, to receive that, because the woman is a crowning jewel of beauty and creation. They're the greatest team between two human beings. But when she shines, that's when men are happy. And that, that old saying, you know, happy wife, happy life. Don't say that with a tongue in cheek. It's actually true. The man was actually designed to give love to his wife and she was designed to receive it. And when she receives it, she shines. So when she's not really shining, She's kind of like a multiplier. There's a speaker that says, you know, you give her a seed, she gives you a baby. You give her a house, she gives you a home. You give her food, she gives you a meal. You give her frustration, what is she going to give you? You know, it's when you give her love, what is she going to shine with? So men don't realize that they are actually the initiator of loving unity. They just need to learn what that love looks like and practice it in a way that she can receive. And you'd be, you'll be filled with joy because she is shining. I really like what you said there about how, like, whatever you give women, uh, your wife will grow. Like, and uh, whatever, whatever you sow, you'll reap, and you'll reap, uh, you'll reap uh, multiple fold. Now, what kind of feedback are you getting from those who have read your book, taken some classes, and watched the videos? Well, from those that have read the book that are married, they said it saved their marriage. 
uh, um, and my video. Uh, there was I did a talk at the Yates Theater about a month and a half, two months ago, and one of the men uh, was listening to my ad on the radio, and he um, went to actually to my website, found the 17 minute video, and he went to his wife. And they were really struggling, 15 years of marriage. And he said, can we watch this? And then, interestingly enough, so she ordered the video and the book. She couldn't find the link. I called her. She did wind up getting the link. And when I called her, she said her and her husband watched it together. She said it was amazing. And the interesting part was she was actually going to walk out the door that day. It was a Sunday. And they watched the video today, that day. And they said, we're going to watch it for the next couple of months, every Sunday together. The video is very profound. It's very simple. It's diagram friendly. It's easy to understand. It's 17 minutes. So I've numerous people have watched it. A couple in Ontario, they said, Brent, this isn't worth $29 because that's all it costs. It's worth thousands of dollars. We watched it twice in one weekend and it blew our mind. Amazing. So the video along with the book, you know, in my view, if you're willing to really practice and do the right things, you can probably sell, save yourself a lot of time and money from going to see a counselor. Um, and you can probably put your marriage right back on track with the video in the book. Now, yes, sometimes it might take a little bit more. Uh, some people are stubborn and selfish and they don't want to really put the work in. But once you realize how amazing this is, I think most couples will want to do it. Now, I do want to get into talking about personality and gender differences, but before we get into that, you write in your book that the greatest need for the husband is significance. Can you explain what you mean by husbands needing significance? Well, men generally, okay, I'll explain the difference between significance and security. So if a man and woman were to go to New York into the dark, deep slums of New York and the bad part of town and it's midnight and they're staying in a junkie hotel and the woman's going to go for a walk by herself at midnight in that junkie area of town all by herself, do you think she's going to want to go? No. Probably not. Would the man go for a walk by himself? Probably. He might look around the corner, but he probably would. Or if a man and woman that don't know each other are walking down the street together and they're going to cross each other in that dark slum area... Who do you think is going to be more afraid of the other? The wife. She is wired by design to pay attention. In the Hebrew, when it says it's not good for the man to be alone, I'll make him a help meet. In the Hebrew, Azer Konegdo, Azer is the same word used for the Holy Spirit. If women knew what who they really were, they wouldn't be competing. Azer is the same word for the Holy Spirit. She has amazing spiritual intuition that men probably don't have. And they have a protection role. Conegdo means she protects, not so much with her bronze, but with her brains. The frontal part of the lobe is wired for consequential thinking, safety, and security. She wants to protect the little ones. She even wants to protect her husbands. Most women say, take care, make sure. And most men say, go for it. What was I thinking? Men want to take the risk. We need to take risk in life. But you want to mitigate the risk. She was designed to complete him to help him mitigate the risk. So her consequential thinking is going about safety and security. Another proof. Little Johnny's climbing up a tree. And Mama Bear comes by and says, Johnny, six years old, you better get down from the tree. You're going to break a leg. He hadn't thought about breaking his leg until she mentioned the proverbial seed. Boom, he falls, breaks a leg. But she's worried about his safety and security. Papa Bear usually comes by and says, Hey, great job, son. If you reach here and here, you can go higher. He wants to, to conquer. He wants to, you know, explore. He wants to, that's his significance. But the, the number one person he wants to be significant to is his wife. He wants to be your hero. You tell me a man that doesn't want to be his wife's hero. It seems like uh, when you watch a lot of movies and uh, especially like movies like, uh, like, brave heart. Uh, it, it's, it's always around this theme that it's, it's a battle to win, a beauty to rescue, and an adventure to live. And that really defines what, what manhood is all about when you watch these movies. W would you agree with that? I 100, I, I'd say God's a romantic, you know, like he, 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 res he rescues us, right? And the husband was designed to, I mean, there's not a woman in the world that doesn't want to be fought for. She wants to know that 
she is his crowning jewel. She wants to know that he's going to he's going to he's going to fight for her. And what most men don't realize is they they get they get the the beautiful wife and then they kind of stop fighting, meaning they start pursuing they they don't really pursue her heart. This is a lifelong pursuit of her heart. She wants to know that you cherish her for your whole life. And and men do, but they think, okay, yeah, I told you when we got married that I love you. If it changes, I'll let you know. You know, it's not something that men are always in tune with, but the man was designed to be loving his wife on a daily basis. And a woman is a barometer of a man's character. She knows if he's on track or not. If his behaviors are are not kind, if they're not honest, if they're not of integrity, um, they're not compassion, they're not committed, they're not devoted, he's wandering off doing things he shouldn't be doing, she knows it. She can read his character very keenly. She's very sensitive. Women are very sensitive in every facet. Smell, sense, touch, character, everything. They were wired to be that sensitive. She lets her husband know. So I say, guys, you look at your wife in the eyes and you ask her, how are we doing? How am I doing? How can I love you better? But the piece that the ladies don't know, they're also the fuel. Mm. They put the fuel in the jets. And when they put their fuel in his jets, he wants to go to the moon for her. Remember, he's not for himself. He wants to go for her and with her. But he likes it when she puts the fuel in his jets because it pumps him up. Okay, so we've talked about uh, the positive side of how men can be inspired by entertainment, uh, you know, with a, a, a battle to win, a beauty to rescue, and an, and an adventure to live. What about uh, TV shows that are really portraying men in a very negative fashion, where the where the the, the patriarch of the home is this dull, overweight, stupid? buffoon how does that affecting men and how is it affecting their marriages right well first and foremost we have to look at the greatest creation of all the number one creation of all is husband and wife man and woman there's no other creation made in god's image and god is love so if you can take out the leader what happens to the rest of the world if you can take out the, the 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 way that the man was designed to love his bride, to rescue his bride, to cherish his bride, to be her hero. If you can take him out, if you can create, or if you can put lies in that man's head that causes him to be um, a dictator, oppressive, now he's not loving his wife. So the teeter-totter is in this direction. And then if you can put lies in females' heads, that you know, we've got the victim pity party going on. We're, we we got to fight for our rights. So now the teeter totter is going to go in the other way. Now we got the woman power thing, and what people don't realize that's actually emasculating the men. So men were too much this way, and now we got too much this way. And Candace always said, you know, where's all the good men? Well, it's only masculinity that fosters and validates femininity. And it's only femininity that fosters and validates masculinity. And the key word is foster. The key word is foster. You know, we weren't given a kitchen table. We were given a tree. Right? We're mini creators. We're mini builders. We, we, we're made in his image to, to, to build, to develop. Well, God doesn't give you the perfect wife at the beginning. You develop her. And she develops you. It's your design as a man that will develop her as a woman. And it's her design as a woman that will develop you as a man. Now, I, I ask a lot of couples, who did God make first? Man. Who did he make last? Woman. Is one more important than the other? No. But there's an order of sequence. If you were to ask your wife, or if a man was to ask his wife to go for a dance and he puts his arm out, ask her to go for a dance, she puts her hand in his elbow. Side by side, but he made the offer. Right. He's the sender, she's the receiver. Check out the anatomy. There's an order. 
The man was to teach, but not preach. He was to teach by showing his wife what this amazing love is that he's been given to her. I asked a bunch of ministers one time, why did God give man woman? Oh, she's my helpmate. What she can do for me. Wrong attitude. From Yes, she is a helpmate. She's your teammate. But the key is that would be self-seeking. Love is not self-seeking. Love is not what you can do for me. Love is what can I do for you. He was given woman to love her. For her to receive that love and shine. Reflect it back to him and them both to their children. So it's only the masculinity. So a woman, every woman wants a confident man, a mature man, a man who takes initiative. Well, if he's passive, if he's a buffoon, if he doesn't know who he is, he doesn't necessarily need to draw strength from her, even though she does fill his, his jets. He needs to bring strength. A lot of women think, oh, I want my husband or man to be vulnerable. I would caution ladies on saying that because women, they, they want a man to be open to her vulnerability. They want him to be sensitive, but not needy. They want him to be strong and sensitive. And if you think about it, they're looking for Christ in their husband. It says husbands love their wives as Christ loved the church. It doesn't say wives love their husband. Who gave their life for their wife? The husband was designed to give his wife for his life. Here's an example. If you have the Titanic and it's going down, you see the movie, The Titanic? Let's pretend we got two captains, not one. We got two. Okay. Male and, fe male and female. It's going down. Everybody's jumping on lifeboats. One lifeboat, room for one more person to get on the lifeboat. Man and woman captain looking at each other. Who do you think's going to say, you take the last spot on that lifeboat? The man. The man. Better be the man. And who do you think is going to accept his offer and be dropping tears down her face when she floats away, saying, wow, that's a man who, who loves. Right. The man is a leader, not because he puts himself first. He's the leader because he puts himself last. He, me first loses. Me last wins. Brent Taylor is a marriage, a Lethbridge marriage coach and the author of His and Hers Greatest Need, available at hisandhers.ca. Brent, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you. I'm Naveen Day. On behalf of all of us here at Bridge City News, thanks for watching.